All right, guys, we are back. Good evening, good morning, or good afternoon. As always, it is so great to see you. And friends, a few months ago, I published the video about overlanding and what it is and how different it is from off-roading. Now, today's video is a continuation of that discussion, and this time we're gonna go over how to get started specifically in overlanding. But before we get to all that, I do want to bring to your attention that like button down below. The like button offers benefits for you and for me for the low, low price of free. You get the satisfaction of knowing that you gave someone props for their hard work. Smashing that like button is also a delightful tactile experience. On a mobile, you can ninja tap that like button in a silent, slow motion. On a desktop, man, you can hammer that left button on your mouse and make that satisfying click noise. But wait, there's more. When you like the video, it tells me that I'm doing a good job and that you want more. So by liking the video, you get more content to enjoy. All, of course, for free. Plus, since we're building a little community here, we're going to start a series of monthly giveaways to reward the loyal viewers. So by liking the video is one of the things that you need to do in order to enter. I'll give you more details about that giveaway at the end of this video. So stay tuned so you know what you need to do to qualify. That said, pull up seat in. Let's go. Obviously, the first key to overlanding is having a vehicle. And as I discussed in my last overlanding video, it's important to understand the distinction between overlanding and off-roading when deciding if your current vehicle is going to do the job. Overlanding is more about the journey and traveling in a self-contained rig for a long period of time. It could be days, weeks, months, or heck, even years. Off-roading, on the other hand, is more about getting out in the rough and rugged trails for short adventures. So you can probably overland in whatever vehicle that you already have, whether you have an SUV, a truck, a minivan, an RV, a motorcycle. Heck, last week I was looking at a trailer that you could tow behind your bicycle, your mountain bike. This little trailer has a little compartment where you can sleep, has a little solar panel on the back, a little kitchenette in the back. It was pretty slick. Is having a four wheel drive a bonus? Absolutely, but it isn't necessarily required. So as a point of reference, my current vehicle is a Jeep Gladiator Rubicon. Now, I've owned many Jeeps over the years and I love how easy it is to find aftermarket accessories for them. But Jeeps are great overlanding vehicles because they are highly capable on asphalt, snow, sand, mud, heck, you name it. It's ideal for tackling any kind of road and terrain that I might encounter on my trips. Now, in my case, my Jeep pulls double duty. It pulls my Turtleback Expedition trailer for those longer overlanding expeditions, but it also serves as a perfect off-roading vehicle for short trips on rough trails. Now, my previous vehicle, that was a Volvo XC60, which was perfectly fine for overlanding, and heck, I could even pull a small trailer with it and added a rooftop tent if I really wanted to. However, the Volvo wasn't a true four-wheel drive like my Jeep, plus simply didn't have the space that I wanted. So if you're ready to get into overlanding, give your current vehicle a shot. See what works, see what doesn't, and if you have the desire and the means to do so, get a more capable overlanding vehicle. Otherwise, stick to what you got. Overlanding adventures might take you from beautiful winding strips of tarmac to washboard dirt roads to rough trails through the wilderness. Now to accommodate all the different types of road surfaces you need to put on a good set of tires on your vehicle. Now there's a lot of debate in the overlanding community about what kind of tires you really need. Specifically whether or not all train or mud train tires are the way to go. Now personally I have 35 inch NATO trail grappler mud train tires on my Jeep. I felt that this was the best option for my specific needs because I just don't keep the Jeep on the pavement. And those occasions when I do want to go off road, the mud train tires from my experience simply are a better choice. However, your overlanding trips might stick to well-maintained roads, so having all train tires might be a better option for you. Regardless of what kind of tires that you get on your vehicle, airing them down to accommodate different train 
is not just a good idea, it's the best idea. Now, how much you air down really depends on a variety of different factors, including how big the tires are and specifically the train that you're gonna be driving through. So for example, you might air down to 12 to 15 PSI. If you're gonna be going over sand and so forth, usually 18 to 20 PSI is really a good place to start for dirt roads that are bumpy to help minimize how much you're gonna be bouncing around or how much bounce you're gonna have going over the bumps. Now, obviously changing the air pressure in your tires requires you to invest in a deflator to reduce the air pressure as well as an air compressor to increase it when you're back on pavement. Guys, you don't need to go buck wild and buy the most expensive deflator and air compressor out there, but you also want to avoid the cheap, poorly made option because you know you you want to have something reliable, dependable tools when you're out overlanding. Now I will tell you this: when it comes to compressors, if you go the inexpensive route, they may work for a while, but there's there's always a compromise, and a lot of that might be how quickly they're going to get the air back into your tires. The inexpensive compressors they take a long time to fill up. So I would expect, or I would advise, it, you, this is one of those areas where you want to flex your budget a little bit. Make sure you get it yourself a decent. Uh, compressor or means to fill up a reliable means to fill your tires back up with air. Part of the adventure of overlanding is heading out for long periods of time. That means you need to have essentials with you, including a place to bed down each night. This can take many different forms. Now I have a Toro Off-Road Skylux rooftop tent on top of my turtleback trailer. Now personally, I wanted a rooftop tent so I would be off the ground and away from predators when I'm off grid. I also wanted something that gives me plenty of space. Guys, I'm a big dude, so I want to be comfortable even when I'm out in the wilderness. And besides, on shorter trips, I have to bring my son with me so having the room uh, for him was super important for me but overlanding doesn't require you to have a rooftop tent you can opt for something even fancier like pulling a travel trailer or overlanding in a self-contained rv on the other hand, maybe you have a normal tent that you want to throw on the ground next to your rig, or perhaps you're good with a bivy sack next to your motorcycle. Obviously, you'll need to tailor your living accommodations to your specific needs. The best way to do that is to go for a test run near your home. Now, there are tons of places to camp near me, which was really helpful when I first got started in overlanding. It enabled me to take a few weekend trips to figure out what I needed in terms of a place to sleep, a place to cook, bathroom facilities and so forth. Guys, I cannot stress this enough. You must do a, a few test runs before you go heading out on the long overlanding adventures. It's best to work out the kinks now rather than later when you might not have the ability to easily adjust your setup. Again, you don't have to spend thousands of dollars on your camping gear, but I would also caution against buying the cheapest stuff that you can find. For example, cheap tents are often hard to set up and take down and their durability is nowhere near what you're going to find in the pricier options. Besides, if you're going to be going out for weeks or months at a time, you want something that you know is going to keep you warm and dry during the most challenging weather conditions. Guys, do your research, read the reviews, and invest in a tent that will give you years and years of service. You get what you pay for, so pony up what you can now so you can have the best living accommodations that you can afford. You see, I was in the Army Reserve component for about eight years, so when I'm overlanding, I'm absolutely comfortable eating MREs the entire time. Matter of fact, in my in my trailer, in my turtleback trailer, I have probably about a good different 20 ready-to-eat meals in there. Now, do I eat them all the time? No, but they have they serve a particular purpose. And I know a lot of folks that are in the same boat as well. When they overland, all they need is a little propane stone, a little dehydrated meals, and a simple chest cooler, and they're all set to the races. Other folks might not be excited to do that, so you'll want to consider your kitchen facilities before the trip. And one little little tip here. We're talking about freeze-dried foods here. See, I can eat these things all day long. Matter of fact, this is my lunch here today. I was testing out a chili mac. Eden Valley Farms. And for the record, what you can do as well, you know, we're talking about preparing uh, when you're going out. If you're sensitive about foods or if you want to just test things out to see whether or not you'll like them, like when it comes to freeze dried foods, if you've never had these, I eat them quite often. And what often what I'll do is I'll try new ones out before I go heading out. And the ones that are in my trailers are one that I have tested out and I like them. 
for what it's worth, worth rather, this one right here is the absolute worst. It was, I like Chili Mac too, and this was absolutely horrible. More on that in the future. So for example, my turtle bike trailer has a full kitchen with fridge, cooktop, a sink with hot and cold water, and tons of storage for food, utensils, and other kitchen items. Now the kitchen also expands out from the trailer to give me plenty of room for preparing and cooking my meals. Now this is a fantastic setup in my opinion, especially for long trips and for people that enjoy cooking. It's also handy when you're traveling with a group because you have the storage space and the prep space to make really incredible meals for quite a few people. Now, something else also to consider. Now, we're going to have a subsequent video coming out here shortly, more on the actual planning side of things. And part of that right now is we're going to be talking about when you're heading out, knowing what your situation is going to be. So we're talking about cooking right now. When I go heading out, there's a few cooking devices that are absolutely clutch. One of them is the Tembo Tusk Scottle. I use this thing religiously for cooking breakfast, lunches, dinners. Now, if it's in a situation where I can actually have fires, uh, Jay Shank is my favorite tool. I can cook a grill. It's a portable grill that I can plant down over any campfire. Uh, when you go to like the state park and they have those, those fire rings with those just nasty looking grills, this thing has your own grill that you get to use. So you don't have to use those nasty grills. And the best part about this is I can go from using a cast iron uh, pan or pot to the grill within seconds. I absolutely love this thing. Um, just got back from Arizona. In Arizona right now, you cannot have any fires. No charcoal, no wood, no nothing. Uh, only you can have propane cookers. So, But I wanted to be able to cook a steak. I wanted it grilled. So I picked up one of those Eureka butane grills. And that actually worked out pretty stinking good. I was actually very surprised with how well this worked. So it goes down. Think ahead of time about what you want to cook. And also look at where you're going to see whether or not you can even have fires. Because that could be a big uh, buzzkill. You get out there thinking you're going to have a campfire, grill up some steaks, and you can't have fires then what do you do? So this is where having those MREs is a great in case of emergency break class meals as well. Now, of course, your cooking setup will also depend on your adventures that you usually take. So for example, if you never go out more than three or four days, you need food storage. Your, your food storage needs is going to be different than somebody that's going to be heading out for a month-long overlanding adventure. When you're just starting out overlanding, one of the best resources that you can have is other overlanding enthusiasts. You will have tons of questions, believe me, and having a buddy to ask for advice is an invaluable asset. Someone that's been in overlanding for a few years can help you make decisions about your rig, your tent, cooking situations, and just about anything you can imagine. Plus, it's a good idea to go overlanding with other folks on your first few trips. The last thing that you want is to have some trouble with your rig or get into some hairy situation because you aren't completely sure about the trail conditions. This is especially true if part of your overlanding trip will include some off-road adventures. Rescue and recovery gear can be extremely expensive. So if a off-roading isn't something that you do often, it might be a good idea to team up with somebody that has things like a jack and a winch. So reach out to your friends and acquaintances, join overlanding communities and check overlanding groups on Facebook to help you or help you meet other overlanders that would be interested in helping out a newbie. And let me just clarify something. It's not just newbies. I think it's good practice when you're heading out, regardless of what your what your experience level is, you know, hey, have have the buddy system. If you have somebody that can go along with you, hey, things happen. And if you're out in the middle of nowhere, your vehicle breaks down or you have a medical emergency, have any friend there with another vehicle or somebody that can administer or get you to first aid or vice versa, that's a good thing. Now, if you don't plan to do much off-roading, you'll want to invest in things like D-rings, toe straps, traction boards, and other recovery items to help you out of sticky situations on the overlanding adventures. Likewise, you'll want to bring along tools that you might need for vehicle repairs. So this can include a good set of wrenches, a good socket set, spare nuts and bolts, zip ties. Zip ties is like almost like the Swiss Army knife, like with, with uh, a duct tape, a shovel, a fire extinguisher, just to name a few items here. 
And also, Paramount in your toolkit is a quality jack. I have a high lift jack, and that is perfect for changing tires on my Jeep or my trailer. And I can also use it to side winch in case my trailer tips over or if I need to help someone else recover their trailer. Guys, not everyone uses high lift jacks though. I mean, they are big and they're heavy and you'll probably want to mount it on the exterior vehicle as well. So if you're cramped for space, a small floor jack could do the trick. Just be sure to invest in a jack that can handle the weight of your vehicle. Something else you want in your toolkit is a good first aid kit. In fact, I'm gonna suggest that you have a couple first aid kits. Having two kits allows you to have one for things like bumps, bruises, and other non-emergency situations that you can keep kind of easily accessible for day-to-day -day use. Now, the other one can have supplies for emergencies like head injuries, severe cuts, and broken bones. But having a first aid kit is pretty useless if you don't know how to use the items in it. Be sure to read up on the basics first, on first aid rather, and even take a class or two before you go heading out on your overlanding adventures. As I mentioned before, you need to take a few short trips near your home so you can work out any sort of kinks in your setup. Think about it this way. Starting small allows you to identify problem areas, mistakes, oversights, and also enables you to correct the mistakes before you go heading way off grid. My first overlanding adventures were just a few days in length, and there were all sorts of things that I learned. I learned how to plan better routes. I realized I needed to make changes to my sleeping accommodations to make them better for me, and I also realized I needed a backup power system in case something went wrong with my onboard power in my trailer. Only after I did these first few adventures did I really feel that I had my overlanding setup really dialed in, and that enabled me to take longer trips further away from home and do so with much greater confidence. Getting started in overlanding is really just a ton of planning and preparation. The more time and effort you put into preparing your gear and planning your trips, the smoother the trip will be, and you'll also be more prepared to meet challenges head on. With that, you've got some solid tips for getting started in overlanding. Now, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Leave me a comment down below. I'm really excited to hear about your first overlanding adventure as well. Now, let's get to the details of our current giveaway. We have an incredible Tempo Tusk Scotto grill to give away to one lucky winner. Guys, the Scottle is one of my favorite overlanding accessories. It comes with a pre-seasoned, it has 10,000 BTU burner that allows for easy control of cooking flame and is super easy to set up. So what do you have to do to enter to win? Step one, like this video and subscribe to our channel. Step two, leave a comment below. In fact, the more of our videos that you watch and leave a comment on, the more chance that you have to win. So get watching some of our other videos and leave some comments. Step three, register on Four Wheel Drive Talk and introduce yourself in the form. Now, if you already registered on the site and introduce yourself, you're still eligible to win. But as I keep saying, swing on by, say hello. We would love to see you. And friend, that is it. For complete details on how to register on Four Wheel Drive Talk and how to say hello on the forum, check out the description below. Good luck. Well, there you go, guys. This was a extremely fun video to put together. It's that time of the video where I'm gonna ask you to do all that YouTube stuff. So if you found some value in this video, if you were mildly entertained, do me a favor, hit that like button down below. If you're currently not subscribed to the channel, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. We would love to have you part of the family. And last but not least, hit that bell, smash it, crush it, to be notified each time that we come out with a new video. My friend, I'm gonna be getting out of here so you get out there, stay healthy, and find your adventure.